morning continuing our, our series on why we need blank. Uh, we were lucky enough and thankful enough last Sunday to be able to start it and look at the, the topic and the idea of why we need God. Remember, we need God as our creator. We need God as our provider. We need God as our redeemer. Breaking it down and looking at it, we need God as our CPR, meaning... We need God as our life. Without God, we are nothing. We would never even be in existence. And without God in our lives, as trying to be faithful children of God, we would not have the promise of, a, of an eternal home. The next thing we want to look at is, you might be able to guess it. Why do we need Jesus? I'm not breaking into question God's wisdom in sending the Christ. I'm not bringing disrespect to the Christ when asking that question because we see the respect that is to be given to Christ over in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 whenever the Bible begins to describe the Christ as wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Oh, we, we see just how, how amazing the Christ is whenever we begin reading throughout the Gospels about his life. We, we, we get to the Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 2, and we see just how amazing the plan was from God and the execution was on the side of Christ to which he became, you know, was made lower than the angels, left heaven for the pain and suffering of the cross for you and I today. And due to his perfection, we have an opportunity of salvation. So before we begin to answer the question of why we need Jesus, we need to take a moment as we get into this lesson this morning and realize how much we love and appreciate the Christ. Look at the events and the things that he done and also made possible for you and I today in order for us to even be here. So thanks be to God for that. Two points this morning. Number one, we're going to be looking at the two M's of why we need Christ. Number one, He is our mediator. Whenever we consider what is said over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, at verse 5, we, we, we begin understanding and looking at this topic of Christ as our mediator. We realize that Christ is the mediator. Not only is He the mediator, but He is the one mediator. Just as if as, Timothy, as Paul says here, 1 Timothy 2, he says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, that, the man, Christ Jesus. We go over to our morning reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the purpose, or to really summarize and give a quick answer of why we need Christ, it's due to, as 2 Corinthians 5 would show, reconciliation unto God. Well, due to sin entering into the life of man, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Romans 3 and verse 23, and, and the result of that sin mentioned in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, that being death, we need reconciliation. We need a rekindling and a regrouping with God. Our relationship with God has been tainted due to our sin and our ignorance, so therefore I need that relationship fixed. Well, over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, notice, and all things are, verse 18, are of God, who has reconciled us, being man to himself, how? By the Christ, by, by Jesus, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, whenever we progress to wisdom that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses on them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Well, where did the sin go? Where did the trespasses go? Well, verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, that who knew no sin, that we might be made known, might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we see the Christ, and God says, due to the, the Bible says, due to the reconciliation that's needed between man and God, the Christ was sent, who knew no sin, to be sent for us and to offer the sacrifice. Remember, because just like how it was in the old law, the same transferred over into the new law, where there was sin, a sacrifice was needed. They offered the, the blood of bulls and goats and things like that in the old law, according to the Hebrew writer. But now in the new law, the Hebrew writer brings out the point of how much better would be the blood of Christ. 
the sacrifice that Jesus done. Turn over with me, if you will, to uh, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Now, whenever we're looking at Christ being our mediator and he reconciles us to God, he is the only mediator. He, he, God sent him to mediate. And God sent him to mediate for sin. We, we notice in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this, in, in the topic of love that we're discussing, was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Go to verse 10 now. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Well, we go back in 1 John chapter 2. Remember what the Bible says. My little children, these things write unto you, and that you sin not. If any man sin, we have a, an advocate with the Father, that being God, Jesus Christ, that being the Son, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we see the sacrifice and the love that was extended by the Christ being the mediator was not just for us, but it was for the whole world. And due to that, notice, notice the flow of this. Turn over, if you will, now to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Remember, we started in 1 Timothy and we've shown that with Christ as our mediator, he's mediating between man and God. God sent him to reconcile the relationship between God and man. He done this by offering Christ as the sacrifice or the propitiation for sin. And now, because of that, notice Ephesians 1 and verse 7. The Bible says, in whom, or well, previous to that, it mentions the Christ, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So we look at the sacrifice that was made through the sacrifice, through God sending the Christ to reconcile us, and Him becoming the mediator, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, we have the opportunity of redemption through the blood of Christ. Now to answer the question, or rather ask the question again, why do we need Jesus? Well, the only way that you and I are going to be able to make it to a home in heaven is through the Christ and with the Christ. So, you know, to answer the question, we need Jesus to get to heaven. We need Jesus to be able to be our mediator between us and God. Otherwise, who is it that is able to stand by themselves with no mediator and say to God, I deserve this? Or, or rather, in this life, God, I have earned this without your son. Are we able to do that today? Well, absolutely not. Without the blood of Christ covering us, speaking for us, guess what? Well, you're not going to heaven. Heaven's not your eternal home. It's a scary thought. We need Jesus, for he is the only way a sinner, one separated from God, one lost in the world, he is the only way of which one can be reconciled to God. But not only is he our mediator who reconciles us, he also intercedes for us. That will be our second point. Jesus is our mediator, that mediator which he reconciles, but he also intercedes. We go to Romans chapter 8 first. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. And just like how we looked at how he reconciled, we're going to go step by step through how he intercedes for us this morning. Romans chapter 8 at verse 34. We just want to see the harmony of the scriptures here and how it all flows together, showing the significance of how much mankind truly needs the Christ. The Bible says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who is also, or who also maketh intercession for us. We need to realize before we begin to question or doubt our need for the Christ in God, we need to realize that their position of authority, where they're at, Jesus is sitting on his throne at the right hand of God, reigning with all power and authority, Matthew 28. 
we need to, you know, realize we need to tread carefully, walk lightly around this idea of why do I need God? Or maybe possibly thinking that you don't need them. Because as we go over to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, he is that what? We, we, we looked at it a few moments ago. He's the advocate. He, he's the one that's interceding. He is the one that is speaking for us. Turn over in your Bibles, if you will, for a moment to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We're going we're gonna to spend a lot of time this morning. There's, there's a reason we only have two points. We want to spend a lot of time in the scriptures and actually visually seeing this for ourselves this morning so we can really understand the point of why we need the Christ. Hebrews chapter 2, looking at verse 17 and 18. Notice, due to the fact of verse 9, right? Uh, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. We see where the Christ came from. We see the purpose of which he was sent for. But notice, due to all that, what he became. Well, he became an advocate, right? An, an intercessor. He became a mediator. Yeah, absolutely. But Christ is a lot more than that. Just because this morning we're talking about him as our mediator and later our mentor, that doesn't mean that's all the Christ is for us. Here in Hebrews chapter 2, it begins talking about Christ being our high priest. And in verse 17, the Bible says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to su succor them that are also tempted. Now go over to chapter 4 of Hebrews and go to verse 14. We're, we're looking at our high priest today, and the Bible says we have that great high priest that has passed into the heavens. Jesus being that individual, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. So we're looking at the one who is speaking for us, or maybe taking the place for us, as the Isaiah writer would show in, in, in certain places, right? As the lamb was led to the slaughter, Christ done that for us. He, he took the place on the cross for mankind. As a whole. So we're looking at this, and therefore, because of that, notice Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Friends, it's a time of need because we need the Christ, because it, mankind has a sin problem. We see the perfection of our high priest, and we realize that whenever we think about him being that mediator, that advocate, that intercessor, he fits it perfectly, as it's later going to show over in Hebrews chapter 5. But if we go over to Hebrews chapter 7 now, how long can an individual... And being no, being not being disrespectful this morning, but how long can an individual be an intercessor? How long can they, you know, be stand in that place? Well, how long can the, the sacrifice of the Christ be effective or good until we need a new sacrifice or something else, or maybe it's just not needed anymore, right? You you hear talks about religion today, and they say religion is a is a pastime and, and church going and Christianity is some it's something old people do, and it's just not new. You need to freshen it up. You need to change it. Salvation has not changed, has it? We we look at Hebrews chapter seven and we go over to verse twenty five. Notice. Wherefore, he is also able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he liveth to make, he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The intercession on the side of Christ, him being the mediator, it's never going to stop until the day he comes back. Judgment is executed, and the righteous go home to peace, and the wicked get punished with everlasting torment. Number two, uh, we, we need Jesus, number one, and we need him as our mediator. What if he's already that for us, right? Uh, previous to becoming a Christian, we're, we're in need of that intercessing. We're in need of that redemption. We're in need of the mediator. But what about post-becoming a Christian? And now that Christ, and 
I, I'm not being disrespectful here, so please don't get upset with me. Now that I've been covered by the blood of Christ, and I, I, I've used that sacrifice, so to speak, what does he do for me now? I'm a Christian now. What does Christ do for me now? Why do I need him now? Right? He, he was really sent here just to die for the world, to rise again, to ascend into the heavens, to establish a kingdom, which he has done in Acts chapter 2, and to set up a law system. Now he, he doesn't do anything anymore, right? Absolutely not. I needed him as a mediator. I need him now as a mentor. Whenever we look at the Bible, the Bible in the New Testament specifically, if we go over to some place like John 10 and verse 10, the Bible says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have life or they might have it more abundantly. So he, he, he mentions the, the, the opportunity of life, but he also adds in the fact that it can be more abundant with him. So post -salv you know, salvation, in addition to being added to the Lord's church, I have the opportunity of an abundant life with my mentor as long as I let it happen. Do you remember, if you've been able to attend with us on the past couple months on Wednesday night, we've been looking at the books of 1st and 2nd Peter. You remember beginning in 1st Peter chapter 2 and going to 1st Peter chapter 4, Peter addressing sojourners, travelers, Christians, wherever they find themselves in life. He says, God expects you to still retain thy Christianity. He says, whether you find yourself a wife, a child, a husband, a friend, a loved one, a slave working at a job doing this in the power of the government. He says, there is a way in which you can still be a Christian. And as a Christian, it is expected of you to do that. That's a quick summation for you. First Peter chapter 2 through First Peter chapter 4. But after going through that, he makes sure to mention each and every time that it's very much possible. And if you want to be pleasing unto God, it is me. Well, if you recall, now in our study, we're in 2 Peter chapter 1. And begin reading with me in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. We're looking at the mentor idea. We're, we're trying to look at this. And we go to verse 2. The Bible says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Notice, through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are giving unto us exceeding and very precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And then he goes into the Christian graces, right? But he mentions time and time again in verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4, these opportunities, these blessings of a better life right now is in the Christ. Well, the question is, with our mentor, what does he offer us? Well, number one, Jesus as our mentor offers us a better life. He offers us a better life. John 10 and verse 10, right? I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Number two, he offers us peace that passes understanding or surpasses understanding. The Bible says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, but I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He goes over to Philippians 4 and he says, be careful for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in your heart, let your requests be made known unto God. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through or in or with Christ Jesus. He's offering us peace. Now, whether it be in this life, which some may argue that point, or whether it be the promise of peace in this life to, you know, kind of get us through this life onto the, the life we're looking forward to, that might be the peace that we have. But he's offering us peace. Number three, he, he's offering us love that passes knowledge. John 15 and verse 9, the Bible says, As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Therefore, continue ye in my love. Break that down real quick. I, I, I think we missed it. Jesus says, As God loved me, I loved you. 
So continue in my love. God loved Jesus. And he sent him here to die on the cross. Jesus loves us. He offered us and showed us a way of salvation, which is through him, John 14 and verse 6. But he warns us. Persecution, tribulation will come, but a reward is very much present after that. Revelation 2 and verse 10. We go over to Ephesians chapter 3 and we look at verse 19. Turn over there in your Bibles if you will. Ephesians chapter 3 and we look at verse 19. Here the Bible says, And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be fulfilled with all the fullness of God. He gives us peace. He gives us love. What, what about joy? The joy that at, at times and most of the time I find it to be the case is inexpressible. You know, I'm, I'm happy while well, I'm a Christian. Can I explain it? Yeah, I can show it. I can explain it. But I don't quite always understand it. John 15 and verse 11. These things I have spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. First Peter 1 and verse 8. Being Jesus, whom having not seen, you love, and whom, though now you see him, not yet, believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And we look at this whole idea of Jesus Christ and the gospel plan of salvation and what God done for us. And it doesn't make sense, and I can't explain it, but it brings joy. It brings sorrow and sadness whenever we get to events in the life of Christ and things like Calvary and, and places like that. We get upset and we get emotional. But still at the end of the day, we see the resurrection. We see the ascension. We see the return of the glory, the establishing of the kingdom, the way of salvation being laid. And we just get happy because it's beautiful. And then, one of my favorite ones, with Christ being our mentor and offering us that more abundant life with a great peace, an amazing love, an inexpressible and an inexplainable joy sometimes, what about a hope that sustains? You offered it. You're going through it. But it's like you need something to keep you there a little bit. Maybe, maybe the love's not enough. Maybe the peace is not enough. Maybe the joy is not enough. But we're all sitting here as Christians, the majority of this morning, hoping for the same thing. A home in heaven. We, we go to a place like Revelation chapter 14, and the Bible says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John 11 and verse 25. We need Jesus today for he truly provides a, a better way of life. Last point. As Christ being the mentor, offering us the better life, how does he do it? You know, Peter kind of summarizes it here in 2 Peter chapter 1 uh, as this, this idea of knowledge of God or through the knowledge of the one who is calling us. But how does Christ do it? How is there an offering for us today of a better life? It's through his word and deed. He provides for us a solid foundation of which you and I can and build our lives upon. It was spoken in his sermon on the mount, continued throughout Matthew 5 to Matthew 7, uh, and then later revealed through his apostles in John 16, verses 12 and 13. He explains both the direction and inspiration. He shows the way and then gives a motivation, if you will, of why we're on that way, why we're doing what we're doing. James summarizes in James 1 and verse 12, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to those that love him. What's the purpose? What's the point of going through all the difficulty if there's not a reward? Jesus says it's very much worth it, and there is a reward for the faithful. Go to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. We're, we're getting ready to wrap up the lesson this morning. Uh, Romans chapter 15. And begin looking with me here in verse 1. Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, We then that are strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ 
Please not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Think about it. Jesus didn't do it for himself. He done it to be pleasing unto God. He done it for the will of the Father. Those that reproached the Father it fell on Christ. Shows it as the example of humility and his service. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3 shows the example of his perseverance. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, Matthew chapter 27, all throughout the Gospels, every account shows the examples of his suffering. We need Jesus today as a mentor because by his, through his word and by his deed, he can guide us to eternal life. As we go through this life today, we need to realize that we need to be in fellowship with God. We need guidance to make the most of this life and prepare for the one that is to come. The only way we can get the good life, the one that leads to an eternal home, eternal rest, eternal peace with God, is through the cross. Becoming our mediator and for the rest of our life remaining our mentor. Covering our sins with the blood that was shed on Calvary and continuing to guide us or walk with us in the light that he is in. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. Without Christ being in the position in our life as number one and leader throughout the Christian life, you and I cannot be pleasing unto God. It really brings a new perspective to that whenever Paul talks about his life crucified with Christ. He says it's not one that I'm living now. I'm living it with Christ or by, by Christ. As a mediator, as Christ being our mediator, you and I will be able to maintain our relationship with God. And as he being our mentor, he will be able to guide us through this life with the promise of an eternal home to come. Like we mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, there's a lot more than just two Two reasons of why we need the Christ. Him being our mediator and our mentor seem like two pretty good ones to me. But friends, there's hundreds if not thousands of reasons why you and I need the Christ. But if you're sitting here, not a member of the Lord's church. Not being one who has put the Christ on in baptism. You desperately need it. You're living a life to sin, walking separate and apart from God, risking each and every day an eternal home in heaven. Taking the chance that if you're not a member of the Lord's church, if you have not obeyed the gospel, if you were to lose your life or the Lord were to return, you would not be rewarded for the of all. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and realize your need for the Christ. You realize your need for that mediator and mentor. And you want to do the things necessary to attain salvation of the soul. You have to do what the Bible says, friends. Not what man says, not what any creed book says, or anything like that. Just simply what the Bible says. You must hear, believe, repent, confess. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Where the Lord adds you to his church, Exodus verse 47. From that point, you let Christ be the director, the, the mentor in your life, and you live a faithful life with him. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, you've done that in times past, but you left the one who loved you first, and you want to come back home. The invitation is yours. Why don't you come down to Kelly's stand and listen?